Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode. I am your host, Jay Green. As always, it is my job to bring you exciting and interesting business owners and coaches from around the world that's going to give you tangible tips on what you can do to grow your business, grow your team, but most importantly, grow yourself. And today, I feel absolutely honored to be joined by Aluba Phoenix all the way from Portugal today. Is that right? You're in Portugal, right? I am in Portugal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah beautiful sunny morning here in the mountains of um, Portugal. Amazing. So Aluba has over 20 years in coaching, specifically in, well, and I don't think just in, but specifically in the technology space. He's worked with some of the giants, the names that like really lights you up. But I came across Aluba because we've been working together over the last, I think, five months in Stephen Kotler's Flow Research Collective on our high flow leadership accreditations and going deep into the brain science and the behavioral patterns behind creating flow. Now, many of you know, if you listen to this show, how much of a flow junkie I am, how much it fascinates me and why I'd be so passionate about this. But I don't know if I should say this, Luba, but I'm going to. You are my favorite person on the calls. Uh, Uh. (laughs) I feel like (laughs) you're my people. You're my people. Like we we think a lot the same and there's a lot of, I think, the the spiritual side of things and the mindset on, on other areas of life that we connected with, but also because you actually work within teams doing the extremely similar work to what I do myself and Mm -hmm. being able to learn from your application of the training and how you're deploying it and how you work with your your private clients and your corporate clients as well has been mind-blowing for me. So I am really excited to have you on the show. (laughs) Well, it's an absolute honor to be invited on and um, you know, I always say uh, we're all each other's greatest teachers. Uh, and one of the things I've loved about the course is how much we've all learned from each other. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, I've been very inspired by your work as well, uh, Jade, and the, the passion and the mindset you bring to what you do. So, uh, yeah, really looking forward to today's uh, uh, conversation. Amazing. I wanted to start with something I read in, we sent you some preparation stuff. And as I said to you, I never read. Uh, I don't don't really read it. It's usually about the guest getting ready. But there was something that stood out and I thought that we could start the conversation here. From fire do all things proceed. In fire do all things live and move. To fire do all things return. From that which is one, one and alone is eternal spiritual fire. Holy shit, I've got goosebumps. I'm going to (laughs) cry. What is that? Yeah, well, this is is my uh, family motto, actually. So you would probably see this, the surname is Phoenix, which is the fire. And that's his real surname, people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's spelled with an F, though, which is a bit unusual. Uh, normally in, in the, well, so I'm from Ireland originally. And uh, there's a Phoenix Park in Ireland spelled with a P-H-O-E-N-I-X. So it tends to be spelled that way a lot up in um, the kind of Ireland of the UK. But um, my surname's with an F, um, might relate a little bit to the Viking heritage, because I know in Scandinavia they spell it that way. They also spell it that way down the Iberian Peninsula, where I am at the moment in Portugal. So I'm not sure exactly what the lineage is, but uh, that's that's the family name. Um, and it's the motto as well. It's a reminder of uh, the truth of who we are as a spirit embodied him. It is absolutely spectacular. So tell me the, because this is part of your origin story, right? So tell me, what does it mean to you to be reminded of that motto? And tell tell us about the, I feel like it's the birthing of the phoenix within Aluba. Yeah, or, or, or a rebirthing of it, I suppose, for once of a better uh, way of thinking of it. <laughs> yeah, for the I right mean, referencing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, you know, I, I had a, a moment, um, uh, I would say, which was a spiritual rebirth uh, in my own life uh, about 10 years ago. I had uh, grown up in Ireland. My father is a South African. My mother is Irish. Um, and um, I had a really nice upbringing in a beautiful part of Dublin. Um, you know, went on to, to kind of get a good job working as a sports psychologist initially and then went on to, to work, work in the IT industry and was kind of living what I would call a fairly normal life. Um, but through uh, 
you know, through chasing money and trying to establish myself in the world and, uh, you know, start to you know, bring a family into the world as well, I had, uh, in many ways, um, become very detached from myself at a spiritual level. I've become quite materialistic in many ways. And um, I think that was probably, you know, in, in some, some fashions, a kind of necessary establishment of myself as a person capable of <laughs> looking after a family and, you know, uh, taking care of myself independently as well. But I had become, as I said, overly um, focused on that aspect of life as a, a kind of core part of my identity. You know, who I, who I believed I was and, and, and how I judged myself to be was, was very much around what I'd achieved at a material level. Um, now, I, I went through a, a period of burnout uh, in work, um, you know, I think around about, as I said, 10 years ago. And uh, when that hit me, I kind of realized I needed to, to reset and recalibrate around many different things. And that journey brought me to Africa, which is obviously where my father was from. But it brought me to to the part of Africa uh, called uh, Gabon, uh, which is in West Africa. And um, they often say Gabon is the is the Tibet of Africa. It's the home of a lot of the African spiritual traditions. So I went over there with my wife, who is also African. She's from Zimbabwe in Southern Africa. And we went to live with one of the local um, tribes in the forest. Um, and we encountered a tradition known as Bwiti. Uh, Bwiti means emancipation. So it's a, it's a freedom tradition. But through the kind of initiation processes that we went, underwent over there, uh, through working within that tradition, I had a, a real reconnection to, I guess, what I would describe as myself behind the mask. You know, masks are used a, a lot in African traditions, and they're used to represent the persona of the person. You know, and it's, it's the idea is that you can pick up and put down lots of different masks and you can change and adapt the persona you are to be the persona you need to be to meet what's unfolding. But that's not the truth of your reality. The truth of who you really are is, is who, who's behind the mask. Um, and I had this moment sitting at the fire in Gabon when I was over there where, you know, this, the embers had just kind of started to die. And then one of the tribes had this fan with feathers and he was fanning with the fire and whoosh, suddenly it all came back up again and I was thinking, wow, this must be where the, the myth of the phoenix comes from, you know, the dying fire and then you've got the feathers with, the, with the, the spirit of the bird and suddenly the fire comes back to life again. And and, and in that moment, um, you know, I had this very strong vision of the phoenix. I felt like there's a real connection to my own ancestors. The motto, the family motto came back up to mind. And it was, it was, it was again, a, a deeper kind of understanding of who I, who I truly am behind the mask. Yeah. And, um, and a recognition that uh, the life that wants to live within me, in many ways, hadn't been given the expression that it needed because I was too much in my own way, <laughs> you know. And, um, and, and so coming back from, from, from Africa, you know, that's when I started to kind of um, surrender an awful lot more to the life that wants to live within me. You know, learn how to step out of my own way, and learn, let allow that, that to flow forth, and um, you know, as a result of that, a lot of what I really value um, began to change. You know, that's not to say that I don't view things like money and that important today. Obviously, they are for the society in which we live, but I don't have the kind of obsession and focus on them that I used to have. Uh, you know, and uh, for, for me today, it, it's much more about what does a good quality of life look like. Yeah. You know, how can that life that wants to live within me, that creative expression, find its expression, um, you know, not just in terms of who I am as an individual, but who, who I am in community as well. You know, because um, life is beyond the individual. Life is the cooperating system of which we are all a part, you know. And that was one of the other real realizations in the, in the tradition over in, in Africa is that, you know, you're part of something greater than yourself and you're part of a tribe, number one. Uh, you know your unique voice within that tribe and within that system, but you're 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 part of that, right? And you're part of the forest, uh, wider ecosystem in which you're embedded as well. And there's no real separation there. Um, and and really coming to a kind of a deeper understanding of that for myself has allowed me to just be very differently in the world, experience myself differently in the world, and experience others very differently too. 
So that was a real moment, as I said, of spiritual rebirth for me. And um, a lot of the work I do today in, 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 in the world of my coaching, and I focus a lot on leadership coaching in particular, has, has sprung from that deep moment of kind of surrender and, and, and realization. Mm-hmm. And, and coming back, to, I say, to the wisdom of the ancestors, because you know it is my, my family name and it was the family model that really kind of rang strong for me and true for me um, you know, in that moment in the jungle. Amazing. And and how do you how does that affect the work that you do now? How does that shape your choices in terms of either who you work with or the way that you work with those people? Yeah, well look, I said I focus a lot on leadership and um, I think the most important thing for for, for, for a leader, the starting place for, for, for leadership is the inner work. And I think before you start thinking about how you can lead others or how you relate to others, it, you have to really come back to, well, well, how are you leading yourself and how are you relating your, to yourself um, at this current moment in time? You know, do you have a, a kind of a clear a vision and a purpose that all parts of you are aligned behind? Mm. Or are, are, you at, are you at war with yourself? You know, do you have uh, you know, different competing goals? Do you have you know, different parts of yourself wanting different things? You know? and, and how do you go through a process to meet yourself where you're at so that you can negotiate with these various different parts and, and get them to a position where they do come into alignment around what's most important and bring a clarity to that? Because in the end of the day, a leader has to do two things, set direction and generate energy. And in order to do that for others and in order to be able to impact others in that way, it begins with your own inner work. You know, when you show up to lead people, do you show up with a clear sense of what the purpose, what the direction is, and all parts of you fully aligned behind that? Because people are going to be looking to you to take charge. So if you haven't done that inner work yourself, it's, you know, it's very, very difficult, as I said, to um, be then be able to lead others. And I think we, we, we struggle to meet ourselves where we're at, and we struggle to meet these different parts of ourselves, and including the dissenting parts of ourselves, the dissenting voices within, right? Um, who may not be fully on board with a particular direction of travel, and how do we negotiate with them? If we just struggle to do that for ourselves, we will definitely struggle to do that for others. Mm. Um, because I believe everything is just one's, one's reflection of the other, the outer world is a reflection of the inner world. So a lot of the work that I do with, with leaders in, in the corporate world today is around what I call the inner game. Um, and working with some very, very simple practices to help them come into uh, a deeper connection and relationship with themselves. And from that place, be able to form deeper and more connected relationships with the with the world around them. Yeah. I love it. Uh, a question I had for you after our, after our last podcast where I was on your show was around, I've been out of the the technology giants for a few years after coming out of recruitment and playing more at a small to medium enterprise level, grassroots and more localized. Back when I was in that field, though, they weren't hiring coaches to come in to work on people's inner work. They were, you know, come in, mm. we, do, we do sales skills, we do, we do objection handling, we do like real tactical stuff, but there was no... We could all see that the we we could all see that the leaders needed the inner work, but that wasn't something that corporates and these big global players were paying for or even really recognizing. And it seemed like it was mm-hmm. up to the individual to put their hand in their own back pocket to do their own personal development to develop their own career. Are you seeing a yeah. shift in that in the world Definitely. now and yeah. with COVID? Yeah. I, yeah. I mean. So, so the, the, I, I don't think this is the case across all organizations in the corporate world, right? Um, you know, I, I think in many ways, we still have an awful lot of work to do to uh, make the corporate world more human. And, and if we can do that, I think we'll make the whole planet a lot more human because it's such a driving force behind everything that we do all the, in the yeah. world. There are organizations, I think, that are further ahead than others in terms of how they view their people. Um, and I, t- today, you know, it's more about the fact that people are the source of competitive advantage in the digital economy, right? So it's not how well you do your business processes or how smart you are mm-hmm. today. You know, these are all best practice things you can download from the cloud. The real advantage, competitive advantage in the modern digital economy is people, you know, and how happy and healthy are they? How aligned, how engaged are they? 
Um, so it's in life and self-interest in many ways that organizations are beginning to you know, understand the importance of you know, working more skillfully with their people. And then what does that mean to work more skillfully with their people? You know, what does it mean to have people be more productive? You know, does it mean having them working longer hours? Well, actually, that's probably counterproductive to them being more productive, right? So, you know, starting to really look at what the science and what the data says and understanding, you know, a lot more about human psychology and bringing that then into the work that we do to create, you know, happier, healthier, more engaged um, humans, I think is um, something that a lot of organizations uh, do have a focus on today, do have an interest in today. Uh, partly because, as well, there's big issues um, around things like burnout in the corporate world as well. Right? So, you know, that leads to attrition and it leads to low productivity and uh, the disengagement. You know, and so even if it's just mitigating those risks, I think there's a lot of uh, you know programs and approaches that are starting to come in that recognise that you know we need to we need to understand that we're working with whole humans here. Um, you know, in terms of the approach that we take. Yeah, see, this is why you're my peoples, right? Because everything you just said there links back to to my uh, my core business motto of happiness is the greatest hack to productivity and profitability. And that mm. if we work on the whole human, it's going to be most beneficial for the business owners to get more profitability. But for us as a humanity, then we're going to raise a vibration of humanity. And I do believe that it's the rest of the fate of humanity rests on the shoulders of the business owners and the business leaders. Like businesses have the ability to change the landscape of the world. Like we have as business, especially if you're working for some of the giant juggernauts of, of the world, right? They have more power than governments if they put their mind to it. They, 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 they do. And they operate like tribes. Yeah. You know, and, I mean, think about it. I mean, where do you spend most of your time if you're working for one of these big companies? At work. Mm. Where, where do you have where do you have a, the, the bulk of your friends in many cases at work um, because you're working so long there's very little time to kind of you know establish those those communities outside of work I, I remember growing up in, in, in Ireland as a kid um, Ireland was a very de- kind of depressed economy when I was growing up it, it took off and transformed in, in you know later years but when I was growing up it was a very depressed economy but I'll never forget how active the community in, involvement was because people weren't working crazy hours so you know, we were involved in a lot of boating down at the sailing club. There was a big active local community around that. They, you know, they had they, they had uh, football clubs, cricket clubs, musical dramatic societies, and a lot of people from the, the, the local community were actively involved. You know, three, four nights a week in 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 these types of uh, community endeavours. Then the Celtic Tiger came along, uh, which saw Ireland go through a period of economic growth, fifteen percent year on year, I think, for a number of different years. And suddenly people were getting good jobs, they were able to buy more, you know, their wealth increased. But all that community activity disappeared. Because now people weren't taking on, they didn't have the time to take on the roles that they were taking on yeah. previously. Um, the sailing club became, um, you know, a, uh, a for-profit <laughs> uh, business rather than a local community activity that had been run before. So... Because people are spending more time in, in their in their in their jobs, and this is why I say um, these these organisations they are kind of like tribes. They have their own mm. cultures, they're, they're, and they're not just you know they're global as well. Um, so I think if you if you look at it that way and kind of embrace that rather than make it a problem, there's a lot of opportunity for oh. deeper connection. There's a lot of opportunity for you know cultural exploration and. Um, and um, I, I found myself a lot happier in those environments when I kind of recognized that what I'm actually part of up here is something that's actually greater than myself. And mm-hmm. so we look back on, I think, in history and on the emergence of some of these big companies and say, wow, that was a, an interesting, you know, <laughs> group of people that emerged with a particular way of doing things, a particular mindset, a particular view, and, you know, made it it's, it's, it's making the impact in the world during the period that they were there. You know, and I, I've worked for a lot of the big tech companies, so I've been able to kind of traverse these different tribes and see mm. the differences between them, um, but also the similarities as well. And it's, it's uh, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a fascinating journey. Fascinating journey. I sort of pull on a thread of something you said there. I was doing some research the other day. I do a lot about when when creating culture, considering like the six human needs and the higher like Maslow's hierarchy and things like that. And when you were saying like people. 
like they want to be a part of these tribes and and now if the people have the opportunity to choose if you want to win the war for talent like you've got to come in with you know what's the impact what can they what is someone signing up to that is bigger than just themselves where they're not just trading time for money they feel like they are a part of something that's more worthwhile and what mm-hmm. that does is that starts to serve that that top of the pyramid of the self actualization because if they feel mm-hmm. like they're contributing to something that's aligned to who they are or what's important to them what they stand for what they stand against then mm-hmm. they don't they 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 can give more of themselves they they they're more passionate they're more dedicated they're more productive because that it's elevated that human need to the the top of the pyramid to see yeah. that through so yeah. what's what's yeah. your stance on that or how have you seen that play out no, I, well, I think a very good example of that is, look, a big focus for a lot of organizations today is the whole area of diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? And um, creating workplaces, number one, where um, we, we, we acknowledge that every individual within that uh, you know, environment is um, a unique perspective on what's happening, you know, uh, with, with unique gifts to share, unique talents, and inviting people into the conversation for you know, the evaluation of ideas leads to greater innovation and it leads to, you know, better decision making. It, it, it leads to better problem solving. And, you know, th- there's a huge advantage to having a, a, a an, an approach to how we work with organizations where we can create a sense of psychological safety and inclusion and a sense of belonging and respect for diversity that, that exists. So I think that's not just required, you know, uh, in our companies from a performance perspective, I would say there's also a moral imperative behind that as well. Of course, you can argue around that because different people have different morals, right? But for me, that's important. And um, I think for a lot of people I see in the corporate world today, you know, being part of the uh, growth of this type of approach, because it is a new approach within many corporate organizations, um, is um, it's quite liberating, right? particularly from people coming from situations where there's historical issues with uh, bias and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, very different demographics who have they not been given the opportunities, uh, you know, maybe that others have, uh, as you know, you look at, you know, women in the workforce, we're seeing a, a huge change in terms of prevalence there as well than there would have been in the past. So, so I think this is, this, is, this is really, really good. And a lot of people, when they're involved in organizations that are taking that approach out, feel that they're making a real contribution to a change in society. Mm. Yeah. Equally, when organizations' uh, stated values aren't lived, that can become a real issue for people as well, but it, because they're attached to them. And, and I think we have seen instances of that very recently. Um, in relation to, to this whole area of diversity and inclusion, for example, we've mm-hmm. seen instances of where those values stated by many organizations have not been lived, um, and that's been during the pandemic. Yeah, and you know, we touched we on this so briefly the other day, and you sent, I don't know if you got all, I'm not sending you LinkedIn voice messages, because I, I was like, I got up one morning, I was watching yeah. Sunrise, and I was like, oh my gosh, my brain's exploding. I can't stop the thinking around this yeah. now because I, a few years ago, I'd um, done some stuff with ABC Breakfast Show around gender pay gap inequality and general thoughts on having, you know, quotas and benchmarks for diversity and inclusion. And I was really, I'm really against having a a benchmark or a quota that needs to be hit because I feel like you end up with the wrong people hired and then that mm-hmm. just perpetuates the problem because you've got someone who shouldn't be doing the job hired in the job mm-hmm. to fill a quota and then they get then that whatever that minority is that diversified person is is a reflection on the whole the collective sum apparently mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. where we were going with it so that that was one side of things that sends sends me off I'm like, but I'm like I wonder if we I wonder if they're going to apply that now to the to the new mandates <laughs> to get the to get the uh, oh, yeah, diversity no, we're going to have a quarter no. of vaccinated vaccinated people well, 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 the, the quota for for unvaccinated in many organizations unfortunately has been zero mm. right this and is, what does that do this has been well, this has been a huge example. For, now, people have different views on this, and I totally accept that. I know for some people, um, you know, we're fully bought into the fact that the whole planet needs to be vaccinated. If you're not, you're, you're, you know, you're not doing your duty as a, you know, a responsible human being. We'll, we'll see it absolutely not a problem. I take a very different view. Um, I, I see that it is complete and utter overreach 
by organizations and you know into you know people's approach to their own personal health and well and well-being particularly with the, with a what's essentially an experimental uh, treatment you know? mm. uh, to mandate that people should have that I think it's huge overreach um, and it, it, it is directly against the, the principles of diversity and inclusion mm. because what you essentially had is a whole group of people those who decided not to become vaccinated uh, have been marginalized mm. and not only have they been marginalized they've been Villainized. demonized yeah, demonized, and they've been excluded. Yeah, by the very organisations that that talk about the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So you know we've seen how in the past sort of sections of our, our society and communities who have been marginalised, demonised, and excluded, right, have been impacted. And then we've recognised the importance of creating more diverse and inclusive organisations mm. to turn the tide on some of those historical, you know, problems of the past. And yet, right under our noses in, in today, we see the exact same thing play out. Yeah. So for, for me, that's led to a bit of a values conflict, and um, you know, because I, I, I see, <laughs> I see, I see a serious, a serious issue there. Um, now, whether we'll, as the fear from the pandemic um, kind of calms down, uh, as as more of the long term research comes out as well about you know the efficacy of some of these approaches, which we see don't actually prevent people from, you know, getting the disease or passing it on. Maybe they can help with symptom control a little bit, but, you know, they're not what they were thought to be when they initially uh, were introduced and when the mandates came in. Do we see things change? I would hope so. We're seeing it in certain countries, but these mandates are still in place in in many organizations. Um, So, you know, I, I think if we're going to have values, which are really important, we live them, and it's really important we, we, we come to them as a, a directional markers when we're working through complexity and when we're working mm-hmm. through challenging times, particularly when fear and uncertainty and doubt are there, right? It's our values. It's the guiding our stars. Exactly. And, and, and unfortunately, I think in a lot of cases, uh, we, we're, 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 we're not seeing that play out today. Um, yeah. We're, we're, we have, I think we haven't seen that play out in the pandemic with the, with the situation with the vaxxed and the unvaxxed. I also think as well, we're losing our capacity in many cases in, within Western societies today to accommodate dissenting voices. And that's mm-hmm. a real serious problem because the whole basis of democracy is we have a space for all voices in the system to have a voice. <laughs> you, know? yeah. uh, you don't have to agree with other people. But it's important to to listen to them and um, you know be curious about what it is that they see and understand that maybe we haven't fully grasped and have a dialogue and have it respectfully and then be able to kind of as I said make some sense between ourselves and come to some synthesis and we're losing our capacity to do that you know what is this whole approach to try to stamp out misinformation it's propaganda essentially because you're you're yeah. essentially silencing a narrative that you uh, don't agree with. So, you, you know, I think we're at an interesting moment in, in our, our development and um, I, I hope that we come back to our values mm. you know, and, and the importance of the individual and the importance of the individual's voice within that wider system. You know, because if we sacrifice the individual in favor of the system as a whole, then I think we've lost the essence of what's, you know, core to our, our culture here in the West. Yeah. Oh, 100%. And I just, I, I know we spoke briefly. I think we were off, finished recording when we got into this topic actually last week. But we were talking about someone who has a an extremely well-known brand in the marketplace in around team building. You know, has multiple books and podcasts and the there's a lot of weight and trust put behind that person's brand. And specifically, they've done so much on diversity and inclusion. They run massive workshops around diversity and inclusion and embracing people and allowing them to be awkward and allowing them to be vulnerable and to share. And then to have someone like that literally out and shame people for and use their power and platform to coerce people into something that's a, a, a medical decision 
it seems absolutely irresponsible to me. It feels like it, it was heartbreaking. And I I implore people and like like we're saying here, we're not pushing our view upon someone. What we're saying is you got to go back to your values. And if you value diversity and inclusion, well, you cannot make that choice to out a segment of society. Like if that's if yeah. that's who if that's your value at a core level is diversity and inclusion, and you've talked about this and you stand by it and you believe in it for like for all of the other reasons when you're building a team, like we need to have masculine and feminine. We need to have like these, these other cultures coming in and having their input, looking at things from another angle, different ways of thinking, like the the Mm. divergent thinking, the different ways that people's brains work, like what, how it's like such a benefit to say, have dyslexic people on your team. And if we yeah. believe all of that is true, which is the shit that a lot of these people have been spoken, right, in these organisations and what the programs they've built to build their teams to then all of a sudden do something that is so completely the opposite mm. is it just it just makes no sense to me. And yeah. my, my thinking when I, was, when I was brain dumping on you the other day was I really want to see the studies behind the types of people like the the behavior profiles or the thinking profiles and the and the roles if there's any studies of the people who chose to not get vaccinated was to see mm-hmm. what we're losing from the market like what what's getting lost from the teams because when i was thinking through i'm like who do i know it's like they're divergent thinkers they've got a different type of risk appetite they don't just conform mm. to the norms they're not a sheep they are able to look at things and some of them might change their mind down the track but they've they're one of those people that's gone you know what i'm going to research this or i'm going to look at this or they've got self awareness they like it's all those patterns of thinking and behavior and mm. and by a collective seem to be a little bit more creative i'm like mm. what chunk are we losing what what brain power are we losing by segregating that i'd love to see some studies around it'd be, that. Very, it, it'd be very interesting to see the uh, the research on it and um, I, I would say though I, I also think it's a very diverse group and um, one thing i'm very conscious of is not becoming overly identified with just the fact that you know i'm part of a particular group right because this is the thing i've seen you know when people are you know Backs to unbacks, it's a divide and conquer. Okay, it's you know, it's, it's I just don't different understand different other areas as well, right? Um, and what on the, on the other side of the equation, I've, I've, I know a lot of people now who are vaccinated who are saying, Well, I would never date somebody who is vaccinated because of all the crazy beliefs they have around you know what, what the impact of being vaccinated is, right? So, you've got these people in different groups now starting looking at each other and demonizing each other as the other. Well, it's, it's, mm. it's dangerous. It's, it's dangerous and it's a lot of nonsense, you know? For, for, for me, this comes back very simply to um, the personal choice and, and it comes back to the, this very simple idea I have that any request that is ever made by one individual to another, right, needs to have three possible responses. Yes, no, or maybe, maybe is the, yeah, let's negotiate, and I'm, maybe not all of what you're asking for, but maybe some of it. Are, like, there has to be space for those three possible responses, because if there isn't, you have a request which cannot be refused, and a request mm-hmm. which cannot be refused is the definition of slavery. Then it, 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 that, that seems like a, a, a harsh thing to say, but for me, it's the truth of the matter. So if mm-hmm. anyone's going to ask me to do something, particularly when it relates to my own body, yeah, I want to you know, hold on to my right to say, no, thank you. Mm. And if, I'm, if, if the society is going to make it uh, so that is has consequences where it means you're going to be ostracized from society completely. What was uh, Emmanuel Macron said? We want to piss off the unvaccinated. We had, you know, Mario Draghi initially making similar comments around, you know, uh, what they were going to do to essentially totally demonize and marginalize people who had said no, people who had um, said, no, I'm, I don't consent to this. For very good reasons, actually, there's not enough data. Number one, right? And secondly, you're taking a single approach to the population as a whole. Yeah, um, the, the the evidence doesn't suggest that that's the right approach to take. So, it, for for actually having sensible reasons as well to to, to actually say no, and um, you're now going to be demonized, you're going to be marginalized, you can't involve in society. Mm-hmm. That's the direction of travel for our governments. That for me, I think is not in a good direction. 
you know, you, we, we see in the world today, you know, the rising of a lot more of these tyrannical regimes, supposedly in the West, uh, we, we have democracy, which is something to be valued um, and it's different from, from what we see in these other regimes. Well, if it's different, it's to be valued, then let's, let's, let's value it. Let's actually value it. Let's, yeah. let's, let's actually live it and let's remember why it's important, right? Yeah. Um, rather than pointing fingers at how bad things are, what things get worse and worse in our own or in countries, let's look within and think back to the inner work. You know, we talk mm-hmm. about leadership as well as being that inner work. You know, so often we point our fingers to, to the other and we see, you know, what we haven't resolved within ourselves projected in the external world. And, 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 and we say, look how bad that is, look how evil that is. We have what we haven't done is our own inner work to understand mm-hmm. how that's playing out within ourselves. And for many of our societies, I see at the moment that's, that's, that's the case. So I think we need to take this back at an individual level as well. But we see things mm-hmm. in society that we don't like, okay, well, where, where do I need to kind where of recalibrate within myself around some of this? It's all an opportunity for deeper reflection around and awareness around you know, our own process mm-hmm. as individuals, as communities as countries and, and, and fundamentally as a humanity on, on, on a single planet together as well. Yeah. yeah. I think that for me with this episode, I just want to, as I said, we're not, we're not pushing our views upon you in terms of do or don't make your own choice. That's the whole thing. Of course. But it, yeah. as a team yeah. leader, if you're running teams, if you're building teams, if you have an organization, you need to have a deep look inside of yourself and ask yourself, are you a person that would normally segregate other people? Would you, are you, were you previously a racist? Were you pre- previously, like, like did, did you have any of these biases previously and ask yourself, is this a rational, is this rational for me to be acting like this? Is this actually true? To- who I am as a human or am I doing this out of contagion based on whatever mm-hmm. I think else is going and look selfishly guys if you can remind yourself of your own core values and ask yourself if you're that type of person to judge and put people in boxes and to to villainize and us and them or like would you ever use the n-word well it's becoming almost as bad to be like <laughs> you like know, you would to, to say you mix with the vaccinated or the non-vaccinated like it's crazy, right? And if you're not, yeah. if you check in with yourself and you realize that you're, that's not who you are as a person, then don't mm-hmm. conform to the bullshit rules of society that's going on right now. Don't conform to the contagion and redrop back into your own personal values and virtues and build your organization from there. And it'll pay dividends because the talents, can, there's talent on the market that's mm-hmm. not allowed to work elsewhere. Like there's a huge opportunity yeah, yeah. for you to open the door. And I'm not saying open mm-hmm. the door for out of selfish reasons just to get the people. Do it out of integrity with your virtues. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But start opening yeah, the door. If you yeah. check in, I challenge everyone just to go and check in and ask yourself, is this real for me? Is this true for me? And if it's not, open your doors. Like start to start to talk about the inclusion and stop making it us and them. Stop making it about that. Ban the. I know. I know organizations that have banned. You're not allowed to ask your colleagues whether you're vaccinated yeah. or not vaccinated. Yeah. It's an. It's an. Yeah. That the vaccine is a no. Like it's a no go zone within talking to any colleagues. It's not allowed. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a good approach. I mean, it's medical privacy, right? In terms of what what approaches people have, have chosen to take, I think that's very important. You know, what what, what, what we, we saw is is totally understandable from my perspective. I mean, you know, I've, I've experienced a, a lot of my friends kind of falling out with me because of, um, you know, the fact that I decided to, you know, say no. Um, and they felt very, very strongly that uh, that was selfish. Right? And that, that was their view. Now, it was unfortunate that happened, but but that has been the case for, for, for a lot of people. I think the mother families have experienced issues around this as well. Uh, but for me, it's totally understandable. There's a lot of fear in society mm-hmm. around, you know, what was... You know what arose. A lot of people lost family members around us. A lot of people would have seen this was a, you know, a, a solution, a savior to 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 the problem. Bad hope. But why wouldn't you want it? Exactly, yeah. it gave people hope, right? And and of course, then you've got a very strong uh, mandate coming down from government as well. So what do you do then? You you we have a need for acceptance. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, you know, as individuals, and, and that means acceptance into the societies in which we are living as well. So 
we will often go out of our way to find our fit in order to be accepted. Mm. But the problem is when you get very strong, dominant-based hierarchies with command and control, which is what we've seen very much, I think, is, 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 you know, you get hom- hom- homogenity of thinking as well. You don't get those uh, people who are willing to be those dissenting voices because why? There is um, revenge and there's retribution associated with that. Mm. So better to shut up, right? And, and see if you can fly underneath the radar or just or, or conform to what's 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 yeah. going on in the narrative, right? That's that, that's what well, that's why diversity and inclusion in the corporate world is a problem because it is important because if you if you get organizations that are command and control like that, homogenizing your thinking leads to same errors in decision making tasks. It leads to getting stuck in the same places and problem solving tasks. It leads to overlooking uh, opportunities from a strategic perspective, and it leads to a lack of innovation. Mm. Right? We need dissenting voices. We need different approaches to doing things, and particularly during a, a medical emergency as well. What are the different ways we approach it? The vaccine might be very appropriate for particular demographics and particular individuals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Great. Let people lean into that, try that. What other approaches are available as well that, are, that work and have efficacy? Yeah? And how do we constantly update our approach based on uh, a, a new, new data. understanding <laughs> of, of the data rather than yeah. say this is the data of one moment in time here are the dogma and and, 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 and the policies that we're going to you know um, prevail from now into eternity even when new data comes up that, that kind of would question that oh, are we mm-hmm. not adapting and adjusting our approach you know and we talk we talk about the importance of being data driven so a lot of the things I think that we we, we know and appreciate are important within the context of our, of our organizations how we work we've lost it We've lost it during this period of time, and it's because there's been deep fear, deep mm. anxiety, yeah, and um, uh, a lot of division in terms of the, the us and them equation. And I think this is this this is a, it is a moment of revelation in terms of you know how delicate and finely balanced you know our our our, our society can our societies can be, and the mm. importance of our values and the importance of really, as I said, embodying them and living them. Uh, you know, and again, I'll take this back to leadership as well. It, you, you need to be clear about what's most important to you. You know, Let's, and, and it, you almost need to be willing to die for it, right? Because if you're not, how important is it really? You know? When I when I teach, so I teach about having a purpose, mission, obsession, and virtues rather than values, mm-hmm. because a lot of people have a construct around what a value is, and they they believe mm-hmm. it's it's a belief and it's their mm-hmm. personal belief, and it's come from whatever programming, r- rightly or wrongly, and but there's yeah. like a box that values live in. So I challenge people to use the word virtues instead, because mm-hmm. a virtue by virtue is something you strive towards, you you choose to opt into. It's designed. Like- or yeah. a collective, right? You can have mm-hmm. different grades of like what's acceptable because you always know like we're striving for this this top level. So you can have yeah. a different gradient structure upon that as well. But I always say once we put these in, these are these are fucking in stone. Like they're not marketing words mm-hmm. on a wall. This is how mm-hmm. we live and breathe. This is what we die by our sword by. Like this is how we choose clients. Mm-hmm. This is how we fire clients. Mm-hmm. This is how we hire people, yeah. fire people. Like this is how we decide which suppliers we're going to to have based on yeah. what's important to us. Like I got asked yeah. the other day to to speak for one of the big soft drink companies. Mm-hmm. And at one stage I was like, oh, yeah, that'd be really cool That because they're like, oh, my gosh, you can impact so many team members by speaking to this corporate event. And I was like, yeah, that'd mm-hmm. be really great. And then I went, oh, whoa. I believe that refined sugar is the devil and that drink is what I use to clean my jewelry. That's yeah, like, yeah. oh, oh, yeah. yeah. And all of a sudden I was like, that's a full body no by me. Like that shit's not allowed yeah. in my household. Like every like yeah. my everyone knows that like that that sort of stuff, because I really am against what it does. And it's it, I believe it's a humanity minus product. Yeah. So why? Yes, I want to help the humans that work there. And I said, if they were running an event. That is specifically because they're trying to curb their way and it's to work mm-hmm. with a team that's going to help them. Then I'll look at it because then I can see the impact. But mm-hmm. other than that, I'm not helping them build their organization. Mm-hmm. And like my, my team's like, do you know how much money it is? Like, yeah. Well, yeah, this is the thing. You, you will let certain opportunities die as a result of that, right? Mm-hmm. You will lose certain, uh, you know, 
uh, friends as, as a result of that. But ultimately, where does it take you? It takes yeah. you to a place where you're attracting around you what resonates with what's most important to you. you know? Yeah. And um, also, you know, you'll see how that works out for you too. <laughs> you know, and is there a need to recalibrate around that? I mean, it's not yeah. like values are something that you hold and don't question. You know, and as I said, in my time in Africa, for me, it was all about a recalibration around what was most important mm-hmm. and uh, trying to understand, you know, my values hierarchy and then what needed to, what needed some adjustment there. So, you know, our life experience gives us the opportunity to do that as well. But, you know, where, where do they come from? And particularly at a societal level, you know, what are being the foundational stone values for societies in which we live? You know, mm. and, and, and why are they important? What happens if we lose them? You know, and, and also what do we need to look and recalibrate around about, you know, the past, right? Because mm. let's face it, it's not all, you know, love and light in terms of our society. Okay, <laughs> we've got our shadow the same way as any human individual will have a shadow with a shadow in society yeah. as well. What needs to be looked at? What needs to be, you know, taken into the light? What needs to be so we want to we want to, we want to think about in a different way and then change for the future, adapting and adjusting as we go, you know, with that greater awareness that, that we have around the you know where we're at at any moment and a willingness to look at what needs to be looked at. Mm-hmm. And then this is the word where again where I, I see the problem with you know um, the, the increasing approach around things like censorship. We were just not willing to look at different narratives. Angles. Yeah, uh, yeah, and different, and different angles of things. You this need is, the is, you need the devil's advocate. Like I want to, I literally yeah. the call just before this. I I run one of the meetings for sort of the culture people in culture and the marketing department to come together to create their their calendar mm-hmm. they're doing together. And I tell them up front, my job in this in this meeting is to play the devil's advocate. You guys, I'm not saying mm-hmm. you, your idea is right or wrong. I'm going to play the devil's advocate to stress test it to make sure. A, that it's in alignment to our virtues. Does it help us achieve what our purpose is? Is it going to get us to the mission that we're on? And does it, like, is it really a good use of our resources? And so I'm going to stress that. Whereas if we have more people, like you said, that quietened, they become fearful Mm. to speak their voice. Like Mm. it's, we don't realise, I don't think enough people realise that how memory is formed and, and how our patterns can be formed and the, the fact like the, mm. the, the hippocampus and the amygdala come on board like with some memory and it could be a memory from something that's so not, doesn't seem fucking relevant to what's happening right then and there mm. in the room, mm. but it's assigned some sort of meaning like when I use my voice or when I speak up or when I'm the, when I'm the one that's the odd one out, I get shamed mm. or I get segregated or I get villainized. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to go with the, with everybody else. I'm not, I'm not. And then we'll end up a perpetuating pattern of this. Mm. And I think that that's, like you were saying, that's the biggest risk in problem solving, creation. Like, mm. Mm. and it's. Yeah, yeah. I totally, totally agree. I, I think what we need is more respectful dialogue. And I think these are the skills around respectful dialogue are some of the things that we're struggling with like today. Everything's become very polarized. Uh, people are very entrenched in their positions. They're they're looking for information that confirms their beliefs. <laughs> Anywhere. <laughs> to ask themselves a question, what information <laughs> you know, will cause me to alter my belief, right? Mm. We're, we're losing that humility that we could be wrong, right? The possibility that we could be wrong. We're, and, and, and this ability to kind of, you know, have our point of view, uh, you know, feel it firmly, express it clearly, but hold it loosely. Mm. You know, be open to new information. Be willing to show respect for the other person's point of view. They're a human being too. They've arrived at their conclusions and their view of the world because they have a different set of filters. That's interesting. I wonder what they see that I don't see. And even if you don't agree with the narrative, what's the intuition underneath the narrative? What's the tr- potential truth, even if it's only 2% in that, that you've yet mm. to grasp? You know, we need to, we need these respectful conversations and these dialogues are important for our meaning and our sense making. And, and there's a skill set associated with them. And, and unfortunately, you know, I don't think social media and, and, and the technology which is pervading our world today helps a lot of this because it tends to drive us towards polarized situations, particularly with the algorithms and everything that are uh, yeah. set up to do that. So we, we need to really look at the impact that this is having and, and think, okay, how do we recalibrate around this? Because if we lose this this uh, this ability for respectful conversation and dialogue, where do we? What's the opposite of that? Well, the opposite of that is contempt. Mm. We you, you know you look back through history to see what happens when one group of individuals hold the other in contempt. Yeah, right. Some it's of the worst sad. human atrocities flow on the back of that. 
Mm. And that is history. That could also be the future as well if we're not careful. You know, respectful dialogue and ability to um, disagree yet listen to each other respectfully is, is it's hugely, hugely, hugely important. Yeah. I, my ADHD brains grab something that you just said then, and we're gonna and I'm gonna take us on a complete tangent. Are you ready? You said the word totally. flow. You said the word flow, yeah. and I went, oh, I love flow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you no, know, interpersonal dialogue is a form of group flow. So when you are in so, a really respectful conversation where you've got that openness, yeah, you get that, you do get a flow state that sorry, sorry. So can you help unpack group flow a little bit more on that? Because and so there was a pattern that, well, ADHD brings make patterns, right? Because I link into that that ability to have those this this challenge skills balance and those areas to be able to develop it. But I'm just going to pass over to you on the yeah. on the subject yeah. of group flow. Yeah, well, well, you know, there's lots of different triggers to to, to the flow state at the group level. Uh, one of them is um, uh, uh, kind of open communication, mm. right, and, and close listening. So that means that when somebody else is, is is talking, right, you're not in your head thinking about what you're going to say or your judgments on what they're saying or, you know, getting ready to say something that's the counter what they're saying. You're, you're in your body, grounded and you're present and you're reflecting on what's actually been offered. Yeah. And you're able to receive that. This is, this is a trigger for the group flow state. So when I talk about respectful dialogue, right, that's, that's, that's part of the skill set, right? Mm. Also with group flow, you get what's called a blending of egos. So, you know, a, a movement uh, away from a focus, a self-centered focus says, I'm me and you are you, to actually there's something greater emerging between us here. You know, system theorists will call it the third entity. You know, who are the two people in relationship? What's the, put the focus on that. Mm. You know, what does the relationship need? As opposed to what do I need as an individual? Like, you know, what does the relationship need? That doesn't mean we lose our agency. Because a really healthy relationship, you, it should be one where there is, there, there is, you know, the, the agency is there for the two individuals, and they're able to be together harmoniously in relationship. Yeah? Mm. So, so these are, these are some of the triggers for for the group the group plus state, and it's not surprising that you know, you know they tie back to some of what we're talking about here about how do we how do we communicate effectively with each other. You know, our, our language and is, 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 is the way we we reach each other. It's the way we we you know. The power of the word, right? It, it, mm. It's the magic that we create, right, in our life, and how we impact each other with, with our language and with our words. So, how do we do that in an effective way? And how do through that do we get into these states of flow so we can become these creative, you know, spirits that we are? And you know, think about what's 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 in the best interest of humanity. It doesn't happen when we are stuck in a narrow perspective, and the other person is stuck in a narrow perspective, and we're unwilling to listen to each other, and all we do is fight with each other. It's just two that's fixed that's mindsets that. with their feet yeah. Yeah. and heads in the yeah. sand. Yeah, clear blocker to flow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, can you? I'm going to circle way back now. At the beginning of at the beginning of our episode, we talked about like it could be counterintuitive to think that we could get more productivity by having people work less hours, and because still yeah. a lot of people are like you know I pay the a 38 hour week, a 40 hour week, a 50 hour week. I want the, the hours. Mm. And mm. I, I literally was having this conversation today, try, actually trying to coach someone out of, I'm like, he's like, oh, I've got, I've got a 50 hour working week. And I'm like, but isn't, let's, let's look at the outcomes. Let's, let's be a little less attached to how many hours you've got to do. Cause he's like, I've got to, I've yeah. got to do these hours to, to justify my salary or like what the business is giving back. To me, I'm like, okay, firstly, no, you give like, we need to have a look at, you need to recognize how much you're actually giving to this organization yeah, and, and where that's coming from. But do you know what I mean? That's the programming that's taken from society that, mm. you know, it's an, it's an hours based contract. And so I've got yeah. like, I've got to justify my worth to the company because I have, so I have to do those hours. Because I'm like, well, yeah. do you need to do them all that week? Like, let's have a look at your rhythm. Like, because I can see yeah. where I can get them into flow. And I'm like, actually, if I can just send you for a float for a couple of hours and like send you out mm. on your dirt bike, what comes out on the other end is amazing. And we get yeah. a way better result technically only working for two hours versus you could have been sitting there for the whole eight hours and got yeah. nearly the same result. Totally. I would I would say yeah. not quite as good a result. What, yeah. What's how so do we how do we shift this paradigm? 
Yeah, well, I, I think part of it is, is, is awareness. Uh, and, um, you know, again, it's a pattern of behavior. Uh, I would say it's an addictive pattern of behavior for many people. Mm. Uh, it, partly because people do get into flow when they're working. So sometimes it, it, it's flow states that people are addicted to, but also it's just, we, we can also be addicted to negative patterns of behavior. But loads of research done on productivity, particularly with agile software development teams. And what that research shows us is that after about 36 hours a week, your productivity falls off a cliff, massively diminishing returns. You know, this is very counterintuitive for a lot of the leaders I work with because um, we work with a lot of high performing executives and many of them are working 50 to 60 hours a week. Mm -hmm. When I offer them what, what some of the data that this says, I said, well, look, this, that may be the case, but there's no way I could get everything done that I need to get done within 36 hours. How are you working? <laughs> right? Even in those 50 to 60 hours, how are you working? Yeah. Are you finding yourself getting distracted a lot of the time where, where it's different focus and therefore you're not getting through things in a productive manner and therefore it's taking you longer to do things? Are you focused on the exponential levers of your business and bringing your focus and attention there? Are you good at saying no to the, uh, the stuff that's just incremental or the stuff that's going mm -hmm. to distract you? Most people are not as effective as they could be in that area, which means that when they are productive, they're not as, you know, in that period of time, they're not, they're not being as productive as they could be. Mm. And do you know how to flow? McKinsey's research will suggest that if you're in flow, you're five times more productive. So this, this is a whole different approach we need to take here. This is, is how do we help people understand the basic principles of flow so that when they're on, they can be fully on in flow, you know, with that 500% boost. But then they also understand the importance of active rest and recovery as an equally important part of their professionalism. Mm. It, it's not something that's a nice to do. It's something that's an important part of your professionalism. Are you sleeping like a professional? You know? Yeah. Question. Are you, you have shut down rituals at the end of the day. Yeah. So my thoughts around that is because we were indoctrinated into these like work hard, play hard, right? And a lot of these high performers, especially mm. in, in the field that you've played in and I've played in in the past, right? It's work hard, play hard. We, we, work really hard and then the way that we relax is we blow off steam we drink too much yeah. we binge watch tv we do addictive behaviors we're not doing active recovery what we think is yeah. letting our hair down is still burning us out and it's because yeah, exactly. that we have because we aren't applying like you said sleeping like a professional doing a routine night routine like a professional that's the reason why it's not working because like, oh yeah, I took a, yeah. I took a weekend off. You drank from Friday afternoon to like yeah. <laughs> you, know, and you, yeah, you need yeah, yeah. you need dialysis before you come back to work. Yeah. So but they're like, but it didn't work. I came back and I was still tired. No shit. Or yeah, yeah. or they wait until they're completely broken to do their their week off. And the week off isn't enough because the sleep de deficit is a fucking two year <laughs> deficit that you're and trying to make the, up. And they bring that laptop and phone with them on the week off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? I know Which some is, of them, if they're know, like a peak burnout, they've gone to Bali and they're doing the retreat. Yeah. The problem is they've gone into detox, but they're only detoxing for a week. So they're still like their body and their system's not reset ready for when yeah. they go back in. Like they haven't actually looked at, and no one's teaching them. No one's saying, Hey, this is going to be a yeah. great week. When's the last time you did a detox? How toxic is your lifestyle? Do you know what's going to happen yeah. after the week? <laughs> Yeah, no, exactly. And of course, a lot of young people, your, your body can withstand an awful lot more. And so you think this is, these are stuff, these are patterns of behavior you can just continue with. Uh, but that, that's what I got into myself in my, in my early career. That's why I hit a period of burnout, you know, because I was, you know, reaching for the, for the wine at the end of the night, just to relax and come down. And sometimes that mm -hmm. became more than just one glass became two or three. I was going out and partying. I was pushing myself. I'll sleep when I'm dead was a mantra. You know, it's no oh, interest in that. There's too many things. Sleep to do. deprivation. Uh, so, That's my badge of honor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this is, it's, it's, you know, we, unfortunately again, it's awareness, but I always think the sports analogy is helpful here. You know, you're based in Australia. Australia is a big uh, rugby playing community. So, so is Ireland, where I come from, right? Uh, today, the Irish team is one of the best teams in the world and can hold its uh, own against, um, you know, teams from the Southern Hemisphere. Not a problem, right? That wasn't always the case uh, because it's only recently that it's become more professionalized. 
up in uh, the Northern Hemisphere, particularly in Ireland. So when I was growing up, right, uh, I used to know quite a lot of the Irish rugby players as a kid, and they would, uh, you know, after the matches, they would be having the Guinness and the whiskey and whatever. <laughs> that 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 doesn't happen any, anymore because today they understand that what you do off the pitch is equally, if not more important than when you do on the pitch. So in the past, when they go down to play teams in the Southern Hemisphere, they get hammered because, you know, they just didn't have the, 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 the stamina, the discipline, the, you know, the professionalism that the Southern Hemisphere teams have. That's totally changed today, right? It's the same with us as corporate athletes. You know, I, I'm, I was doing a session for, for a leader getting ready for a session and, uh, on flow states. And he said to me, what preparation do we need to do for the team in advance? And I said to them, same preparation I ask all the teams, make sure they have a good night's sleep. Right. That's, that's the only preparation required. Oh, I don't think that's going to happen. We're all going out and, uh, you know, going to have a meal and everyone's going to be, it's going to be a late night. And, you know, what they typically you'll see with, with sales teams when they get together, right? They're getting hammered <laughs> they're up till, you know, how late in the evening time. And then they're, the next day, they're not going to be at their, at their best. The evening time. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, 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 and these are, these, there's nothing wrong with that, but there's, that's a choice and there's an impact mm. to it. And there's, and, and over time, there can be very serious impacts to this if it becomes a predominant mm. pattern of how you're approaching your work. Equally, if you're looking for sustainable high performance over the long term, that requires a different philosophy and it requires a different approach and it actually requires a different set of values. Now, here, here's where the values recalibration, I think, becomes important, right? Virtues, uh, I guess, from, from your own perspective. But I would say for many people, work is a virtue for many high performance it's right up on the top of their values hierarchy. And it's, you know, when they, they hustle, hustle, hustle. It's right, it's, it's, right up they, there in the self-actualization pyramid. <laughs> exactly. And when they don't, then they don't think they're a good person. So, so let me give you an example of this. I was chatting to a chap the other day, older gentleman, uh, been in the workforce for, for many years. He, uh, he says he notices in the, in the afternoons when he takes a nap, he's generally much more productive after that. However, every time he goes to take that nap, when he allows himself on occasion to take that nap, he feels dead guilty because he's not available to things person. and everything that are coming on. Yeah, exactly. Because for him, rest and recovery is down here on the values hierarchy. Our self-care is down here. So the first thing that gets sacrificed when the pressure of the job comes on is the self-care. And when you do start to indulge in self-care, you're being self-indulgent, you're being, you're being selfish, right? This is not a recipe for high performance. So there's a recalibration in our values hierarchy where we start to anchor onto that virtue that's up there with work, but understand that your active rest and recovery is equally important part of that work. Because if your goal is to deliver a sustainable high performance over the long term, you need to have a disciplined approach to your active rest and recovery. It's a fundamental part of your professionalism, just as it's a fundamental part of professionalism for an athlete. So again, you know, are you sleeping like a professional? Do you know? Do you have the data to tell you whether you are or you're not? Do you, are you tracking your sleep? Right? You know, what's, your, what's your approach to your shutdown rituals at the end of the day? Do you have a period, a point of the day where you stop and then you have a protocol and a ritual that you go into to allow your body to wind down before you go to bed? How are you building in, in periods of time of active rest and recovery in your calendar over the course of the year, over the course of the week, you know, even throughout the day as you're working? I, I spoke to a manager the other day, hadn't had a holiday in two years, you know, because too much going on. <laughs> so so the, the, these choices have consequences, these choices have impacts, and, and we can always make different choices at different times. Now, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the, the culture uh, in many organizations is one of overwork. And it's one of overwork seen as a virtue. But that's why we have a systemic yeah. issue with burnout. We have yeah. a systemic issue with burnout across the corporate world today. So creating awareness and encouraging people to make some choice changes and according organizations to uh, also wake up to their duty of care for people as well, I think is, is a large part of the work I do actually today. It's, it's, it's really trying to help people, as I said, recalibrate around their own biology and recognize that if human beings are the source of competitive advantage, which they are in the modern digital economy, how do we work skillfully with our own biorhythms? How do we know ourselves, our biology in a deeper way and be able to adjust and adapt around that so we get the best out of ourselves as individuals, as teams, as organizations. And that often means doing things which is very counterintuitive to what we were previously done in the past. Yeah. Yeah. 
I uh, I think that's the mic drop moment. I actually, uh, listening to what you were just saying there, I created a training session just the other day for my clients on over- annihilating overwhelm and all of the things mm. that we were talking about there in the levers, but what you need to do to counteract that. So if anyone wants that, I'll make sure the team can put a link. I'll give my, it's my actual client training, but for podcast listeners, we'll give it to them. There'll be a lot of stuff that you're familiar with because it comes from the Flow Research Collective's three different courses Mm -hmm. along with a bunch of the books that I've read. Mm -hmm. Aluba, can you tell everyone where can they best consume more of you? Yeah, so my website is vivid-imagination.co.uk. So you'll find more about my uh, work there and also the link to to the podcast and uh, various different articles as well you'll find on that site, yeah. Yeah, awesome. I think we're going to need to do this again because there's so much I want to unpack around that. The the statement that I the the thing that's ringing in my ears that I I really want to hammer home is that the work you do off the pitch is equally, if not more, important to what happens on the pitch. And I'd love people to go away and unpack them that for themselves and ask themselves what are they doing off the pitch or outside of work that's having a negative impact on mm-hmm. their performance when they're in in their driver's seat. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Jay, this has been a blast. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you, my friend. I am super grateful for you and I can't wait to do it again.